Welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us in our lunchtime seminar. And we realize this is probably a bad timing just before the Easter break, but I uh, appreciate you coming uh, and listening to our speaker today, who's uh, Catherine Catalan, who's, of course, going to be talking about her research in, in the north of Iceland in Hegrenes. Um, uh, many of you know Kat, of course, already, and she's, a, she's got a, currently got a postdoc position at Boston uh, in North America, and she's been working in Iceland since 2009, uh, particularly affiliated, of course, with the, with the research up in Skagafjord that we heard a few weeks ago from, from Doug. Um, and uh, she is today going to be talking about uh, small dwelling sites during the settlement pe period uh, in Skagafjord. Uh, so with that, I'll hand you over to Kat, uh, and uh, we'll take questions afterwards. Thank you, Kat. Uh, that sounds great. Thank you so much for that, Gavin. Let me get my screen share back up. <clears throat> okay, hopefully you can see that now. Um, so uh, yeah, thank you all so much for being here, and thank you for the invitation to speak to you today. It's it's wonderful to see everyone, and I've enjoyed learning so much about your work over the last few months, despite being on the other side of the ocean, and I really hope I'll be able to see a few of you in person again sometime very soon. Um, so as, as Gavin said today, I'm going to talk about the results of my dissertation research into small settlement period dwellings on Hegrenes in Skagafjörder. I presented some preliminary results to this audience when I was in Reykjavik in 2017, but now the work is done. So I'll discuss uh, a lot of the results of the work as well as my uh, interpretation of these small places and hope that we can get some good discussion going at the end of the talk. You've already heard a little bit about SCAS and the FLASH project from CC Cesario and Doug Bolander in earlier talks in this series, so I'll just give you a quick refresher. Um, SCAS, the Skagafjörder Church and Settlement Survey, is a traditional settlement survey um, set out to determine the size and establishment date of farmsteads in the Hegrenes region, with the addition of medieval churches to find out which of the farms had household churches in the 10th and 11th centuries and understand the role of the church in the developing regional political economy. You heard a little bit about the churches in Doug's talk two weeks ago, and I won't be touching on that today. <clears throat> So the SCAS project was led by Doug, along with John Steinberg, Gunni Zoega, and Brian Demiara. And it supported an assortment of masters and doctoral students, including myself and Cece, who talked about the zoo archaeology of the project last month. So for my dissertation project, uh, FLASH, that's for Beely Landscape, an archaeological survey on Hegrenes, I chose to separate from the farms and instead look for evidence of little sites far from the centers of known farms. Um, on the map on your screen, uh, the target icons, um, here, oh, yeah, it's purple. Um, those target icons uh, show the small outlying sites where I found evidence of occupation in the form of midden material dating to the 9th through 11th centuries. And the black dots on the map show the actual farms that were the focus of this gas project. I started with actually a pretty good idea of where the sites would be if they existed. Most of them are, had been mentioned in surveys going back to the Yardabok Garner Magnusonor from uh, 1713, and those sources include the Sislok Sotna Lysinger from the mid 19th century and the Ornefnuskrau from the mid 20th century, up through most recently um, Hjalti Paulsen's Big the Sogar Skagafjörder volumes, um, which have been published in the late 20th and early 21st century. And in that book, he included not only descriptions of the sites, but also wonderfully GPS coordinates. Uh, so I did have a, a pretty good starting point. Now, often these uh, historical surveys um, allude to the possibility that the sites were inhabited at some point in the distant past and sometimes refer to them as Fortbili, which is uh, ancient farms, um, hence the name of my project. Um, but those surveyors are often a little bit skeptical of the possibility that people lived there, as in the quote on your screen, which indicates that such a small field could never have supported a dwelling. And no earlier sources mention the sites at all. There's no mention of them in the Diplomatarium Islandicum, for example. Um, and today, the surface ruins are mostly uh, stekker uh, weaning pens and enclosure walls that date to the 12th century and later. Most of those were already in ruins by the time of that 18th century survey. And all of these sites are located at least a few hundred meters and up to about a kilometer or so away from the nearest farmstead. So finding the location wasn't too hard. Um, but I could easily have found zero evidence for any use of the site prior to those animal buildings. However, as it turned out, of the 18 sites that I investigated, 13 of them had middens dating from the medieval period, and of those 13, 11 of them actually date to the late 9th or early 10th century, so right at the beginning of the settlement period. <clears throat> 
All right, so I'm going to run through the results of uh, the entire survey. There's a lot of charts on these screens, but I wanted to take the opportunity to share this with an audience that is uh, familiar with the context of Iceland, so uh, please bear with me. Here's the details about the dating. All of those 11 sites with settlement period middens appear to have lost their habitation before the 12th century. Uh, so this representative section from the small site at Greinagerdi shows middens starting just above the landam layer and ending significantly prior to the 1104 tephra layer, which is this a really blurry white line up here. A couple of the sites are even capped by a late 10th century tephra, and that tephra layer is still undergoing analysis towards more precise dating, but it seems to fall somewhere between about 980 to 1000. And radiocarbon from the lowest context of all the sites puts their establishment solidly in the late 9th or 10th centuries. I don't have a corresponding slide for the farms in this gas survey. Um, however, none of them were abandoned anywhere near this early. And in fact, most of the farms are still inhabited today. And as for the establishment dates of the farms, they show a wider range of um, early estates. Um, starting at uh, also in the uh, late 9th century. And some, some of the farms actually don't, don't begin until uh, even as late as the 11th century. So these maps give very rough estimates of the dates. And uh, the data I'm showing is preliminary. Uh, but they serve to illustrate how the settlement pattern changed over the first three centuries. So at the first moment of settlement, all of the small dwellings, and those are the green triangles, and many of the farms were established. Uh, during the first century or so, more farms were established coming in as the orange squares. Um, and it's possible that some of the small sites were already being abandoned, but uh, sometimes that, that end date is a little bit questionable, so I haven't taken any, any of them away here. Um, however, by the end of the 11th century, many more farms were created, those coming in as uh, purple squares. And all of the small dwellings were depopulated, which I show by turning the triangles black. So essentially, we have a period when farms and small sites coexisted, um, followed by the establishment of many new farms and the complete loss of small dwellings um, by 1104. Coring was the main methodology used to locate early midden at the sites to get some dating information and to estimate the size of the site. So site size or area is measured as the extent of cores that contain midden or turf below the 1104 layer in situ. And you can see on the map how we carry out that analysis in GIS by excluding cores with no midden, and those are these plain X's um, from the analysis or from the uh, size estimate of the site. So because the area of midden at the small sites is really so very small, it required a large number of cores on a very small grid of about 10 meters or less to demonstrate that there actually was an area of medieval midden at the sites. So the chart on the right side of your screen demonstrates that between the two projects, we appear to have captured the full complete range of variation in site size across Hegrinus. So uh, the triangles again are the small sites, whereas the farms are circles on this plot. So of these three in the middle, um, I might need to get rid of that because you can't read the names of the sites anymore. Um, but Hendelcott, that's the one that I blurred out here, and uh, REAP2 are the, those two sites that I mentioned were established after 1104. So those started late. Um, while Neiferstetter, this uh, one that you can't really see at the top now that I highlighted it, um, that one has a phase that starts in the late 11th century and continues into the early 12th century after an, an early phase. So I interpret these very late sites and phases as actually part of that last phase of farm creation that you saw on the last slide, um, rather than uh, slotting them in with the um, small dwellings that have very early settlement dates. So this significant difference in aerial extent between farmsteads and the small dwellings does not appear to be merely due to greater length of occupation at farmsteads. So if we look at just the eight farmsteads on Hegrinus that were established after about 1000, their area at 1104 averaged about 4000 square meters after less than a century. And that's still far larger than the small dwellings, which range in size uh, from 30 to about 600 square meters. Um, so I therefore think that the difference is best explained by smaller populations and a different set of production activities at the small, the small dwellings than what's occurring at the farmsteads. I've done a bit of work to estimate how many people might have lived at these small sites. And this is very rough. Um, it's based on the size of the middens uh, compared against either the average cemetery population um, from the cemeteries at uh, Keplavik and Keldajalar from um, Guni's work, which uh, Doug talked on a couple, touched on a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, or it's, it's based on the uh, documented 19th century farm population. So I know these aren't really the 
that they aren't exactly good measures, but they are the best measures that I have as a potential way to estimate this. Um, and as it turns out, the average 19th century farm population is in fact reasonably well correlated uh, with the pre-1104 farmstead size. And that's shown on this plot for the actual large farms in this gas survey. And that fits pretty well with other metrics that we've seen uh, before in Skagafjörder where the size of the, the uh, uh, midden or, or farmstead at um, 1104 correlates really well with measures of farm productivity that we have from documents through the 18th and 19th century. So it's not super surprising and it does suggest that uh, maybe this an analysis makes a little bit of sense. So I worked this out a couple of different ways. Um, the small dwelling sites are shown on the right side of the chart with population estimates based on the two different ways to calculate. And the left side of the chart shows the average 1104 site area per 19th century person. Maybe I'll, if I change my ink color, maybe you can see it better if I highlight stuff. Um, so dividing this average um, farmstead area per person, the 714 number, into the site size of the small dwellings, then you get the population counts that are shown in this middle column here. Using the cemetery data, um, which according to Goodney suggests an average of 10 people per farm at any given time through the 11th century, that works out to about uh, 1,000 square meters per person and a site population roughly similar to the 19th century uh, data. These both lead to estimates of really no more than one person living at each of the small sites. So obviously there's potentially some issues with this analysis. Um, but that cemetery estimate of 10 people per farm is very close to the average 19th century population, both for those two farms in particular and the overall 19th century population average per farm, which is 9.6. So I don't think it's a completely unreasonable way to look at this. And again, the largest three sites that are, are highlighted in gray here um, are were established very late compared to the others. And they seem more like farms that just didn't make it long enough for there to be written records about them. They're in the same side range, size range as the smallest, latest farms in the survey. Um, this one here, 1139, and this one at about 1,000 square meters. So I think what this population analysis suggests is, is one of two things, or maybe both of these things. Uh, so first, the sites had very low populations, maybe two people at a time if we're very generous, and or they were doing something pretty different from what was happening on the proper farms that resulted in a different taphonomy of mid and accumulation at these sites versus the farms. So among the 11 sites that were established early and that were also abandoned early, there's two basic types which I've been calling outposts, um, shown with this example on the left of the screen, and uh, the other uh, type which I've been calling huts, shown on the right of the screen. So outposts tend to be larger with a charcoal-based midden matrix, while huts are smaller with mostly peat ash in their middens. And these hut type sites also often showed evidence of truncation of the subsoil. That is, uh, it had been dug down. And in this example, you can see the basal glacial gravel at the bottom of the unit uh, before the midden was excavated. So Grinecott in this example has a cobble floor between two different phases of midden uh, deposition. This site did, as with all of the sites, uh, date to uh, that very early settlement period. Um, unfortunately, I don't have capping tephra, so I'm not sure how late it extended uh, at this particular site. Um, so hut sites, um, these, these mostly peat ash based ones, they, they bear some resemblance to what one might expect from a pit house. Although the midden layers were not as compact as one would usually expect a floor to be. And there's also no clear obvious indication that these were interior spaces. Although without a full open area excavation, it's, it's hard to say that for sure. So all of the excavations were um, one by one uh, units. Um, a couple of them were expanded for, for CCs um, to, to get more um, zooarchaeological material for CC's work, but none of them were larger than about um, um, two by two meters. So along with these differences on the previous slide, we also get more zooarchaeological materials from the outposts, as well as more finds in general from the outposts. And I also want to draw attention to the large differences in charcoal content between excavations at small sites and at farmsteads. So the percentage of charcoal in flotation samples is more than 50% um, at small sites and less than 50% at farms in all time periods that we looked at. <laughs> 
Farms often do have a very early charcoal rich phase, and that's been observed in other places around Iceland too. But at least in Skagafjörður or in Hegrenes, those early charcoal rich contexts were more than twice as thick at small sites than they were at farms. And this is thinking um, particularly of the outposts in this case, which, which have that uh, charcoal context. So then after that first approximately eight centimeters of uh, primarily charcoal based midden at farmsteads, all of the farms transition to, to very, very deep um, layers of primarily peat ash up, um, up to uh, the, the late medieval and into the, the, the modern period. While the small sites, again, particularly the outposts, do not ever transition um, to a primarily peat ash midden. So this suggests that people at those sites were burning charcoal far later than, than they did at the farms. And thus they may have been cutting down trees, uh, actively participating in deforestation right up until the sites were abandoned. And we do have one possible charcoal pit at one of the sites, and this comes from a Manaus. Okay, so what about that zooarchaeology? Cece talked about this in much greater detail back in February, and I've borrowed this chart from her dissertation. But essentially, I won't go into detail here. If you're interested, you can you can watch her recorded talk. Um, but the thing to note here is that the small dwelling sites that had sufficient bone for her analysis have far higher ratios of wild to domestic animal bones than is usual at farms in Iceland from this time period. Although as, as uh, Cece's chart here shows, it's not necessarily so strange from a North Atlantic perspective more generally. Um, and one thing to note here is that um, Vattenskot, one of the sites that, that Cece investigated is actually a farm and not one of the uh, small sites, which is the case for all of the other ones that she looked at. So I'll come back to this a little later in the talk. Okay, so how about artifacts? We got the full range of artifacts from all the small dwelling sites, including some pretty spectacular bone pins. We also get a lot of pretty pebbles, which seem to be popping up from lots of other sites around Iceland too, so I'd be interested to talk more about that. And we get tons of iron, especially what appears to be several boat rivets from one particular site, uh, Kaltid, which potentially could be related to the high proportion of fish bones at the site. Um, the chart is here to emphasize one un unexpected result, which is that the small dwelling sites did not have significantly fewer artifact finds than the farmsteads. It's actually pretty close to the same number if you don't count uh, those pretty pebbles. This suggests that there may be no obvious status difference between people at the farms versus the small dwellings, although of course all of this is only coming from one by one test units and things like glass beads and silver were not found at the small dwellings. And we do have some uh, paleoethnobotanical results. Um, there was barley present at nine of the sites, and there were oats, or potentially oats, uh, certainly um, avena, present at Grænagerði, one of the sites. Almost all of the oats uh, from Grænagerði date to the post-1000 uh, context. Um, and I do want to draw your attention to one thing on the radiocarbon data. Um, the very earliest dates that we're getting are all coming from um, wild seeds, from um, uh, Ericaceae and Ampetrium seeds, uh, that's heather and blueberry. Um, the rest of the things that we radiocarbon dated were from uh, barley, one of the oats, and uh, animal bones. So this suggests potentially that there might be a lag between site establishment when the sites were burned and first cleared, uh, and the earliest attempts to either grow crops or use dung from animals who grazed on crops at the sites. And there's lots of questions remaining about exactly why we're seeing this difference between the, the charred wild seeds and the charred domestic seeds. Um, and hopefully we'll have the chance to, to um, investigate this uh, question more in the future. But if anyone's seen something similar, I'd be curious to talk about that. So the building ruins on the sites were dated via coring and tephrochronology, and as I mentioned earlier, most of the buildings and walls were constructed after 1104. Some of them also appear to have buried turf that predates that 1104 layer, possibly part of the dwelling house that was contemporary with the midden. So three of the sites, uh, the one shown here, have visible ruins on the surface that might at potentially at least incorporate elements of the original dwelling house. So we might be seeing bits of uh, the, the um, dwellings that actually go along with the small middens on the surface at, at a few of the sites. <laughs> 
Another result from the coring has to do with erosion and sediment accumulation. So first, enclosure walls have a significant positive effect on soil retention. And this is actually true both at farms and at small sites. This is particularly evident at this site, Toonfilter, where the deeper soils inside the enclosure wall are obvious even if you're just standing there looking at it. Um, on average, soils inside boundaries are about 15 centimeters deeper than those outside the walls. And this metric includes both farms and small dwelling sites. These turf walls around the fields acted to catch airborne sediments as well as to inhibit erosion. So I do want to note again that enclosure walls at small dwellings were all built after depopulation, post-1104. So the walls go with the later use of the site for livestock. So what they seem to be doing is protecting early sediments from later erosion events, which suggests that erosion at the sites may, may have been worse after 1104 than it was during habitation. And along with just soil depth on the, from the last slide, I also investigated whether certain tephra layers were more or less likely to be observed inside enclosures using an odds ratio. Um, so this one gets a little technical and hard to look at, so, so sorry about that, but please bear with me. Um, all tephra layers are more likely to be observed inside enclosures, whether you're looking at farms or at small dwelling sites. However, when you compare the farms versus the small dwelling sites, inside versus outside of enclosures, uh, what I find is that small dwelling sites are twice as likely, and it's these numbers that are highlighted here, small dwelling sites are twice as likely to have prehistoric tephra layers inside enclosures than farms. And those prehistoric tephra layers are the Landam layer, the H3, and the H4 layer. This suggests to me that some kind of field preparation and disturbance may have been happening at farms but not at small sites, potentially getting ready to have some kind of uh, functional home field at the farms, uh, but maybe not so worried about cr creating uh, a home field at the smaller sites. Um, final points about enclosures, all of them are less than one hectare in size. That's generally thought of as the smallest possible size for a farm, about what you can feed one cow off the produce from one hectare, uh, which suggests that usable land at the sites may have been too small to turn into a farm, which harkens back to what those 18th century surveyors thought about these places. However, it's certainly possible that the standards for farm size have changed between the settlement and the historic period. Okay, so there you have all of the data. And now I'll run through a few possible interpretations. And I have a favorite, but I'd really like to hear what all of you think about this. So first, could these places have been settler camps? Could they have been places where people lived while waiting for a farmstead to be ready? So often pit houses are described in these terms as a place where people lived while waiting for the longhouse to be prepared for them. Um, but pit houses are usually located much closer to the eventual longhouse than these sites are often just meters away. However, this could be selection bias uh, since most known pit houses have been found during excavation of the nearby longhouse. And it's also possible that people could have camped at these places temporarily while waiting for whole farms to become available elsewhere in the region. There's limited suggestion of this from Lanham, from Lanham book, uh, where in fact, um, Haberder Hegri, the Lanhamsman from Hegrinus, does not have his own section. He shares it with this uh, new arrival, Krakukreder, um, whom he meets on the shore and allows to overwinter on Hegrinus, and then he helps Freder to find a, a new farm the following spring. Um, so one might assume that Freder and his party stayed at Haberder's farm, uh, but the text doesn't specify that. It's possible that they may have stayed at some other place on Hegrinus, a place that wasn't exactly a farm. Um, and the fact that Hegrinus uh, doesn't have its own, uh, that, that, that Hegrinus and Haveter don't have their own section in Lanama book raises the possibility that maybe this sort of thing was common in Hegrinus specifically. So this is kind of a long shot explanation, but I think it's a good story and it's really fun to be able to pull in the written sources uh, when I talk about these sites, uh, even though um, there's no specific direct mention of them. Second, what if these are failed farms? Maybe this kind of site is just the first stage in creating the farm and these sites just didn't make it uh, in, in the long run. Uh, that seems to be true at at least one of the sites, uh, maybe at two of the sites. And it certainly does seem to be the case at the two sites in the, the study that weren't even established into the, uh, and, and until the 11th century. That's uh, Hendelkot and Reap II, those, those two larger sites and those, um, seem to have begun as part of that final phase of, of farm creation on Hegrinus, um, but they didn't last longer than a few centuries, not long enough to make it into any of the written documents. 
So a couple of points in favor of uh, this interpretation. Some farms uh, on Hegrinus have early charcoal rich phases with high wild food counts. And this is also common around Iceland as well. Um, in particular, Utenverdenus had a very early, mostly charcoal based phase with large amounts of wild bird bones in them. Um, I also um, mentioned Vatenskaz earlier, which was one of the farms in the survey that also had a, a very large uh, charcoal rich, bone rich uh, context. Uh, several of them, in fact, at Valens Cut. Um, second, some of the small dwelling sites actually appear more farm-like in later phases by around the 11th century. In particular, uh, that relates to a uh, knife setter on Aus, which is in the picture here, and Greinagerdi, which I, as, as I mentioned earlier, has uh, higher proportions of oats and barley in later phases than in early phases. At Neiferstetter, there's a very long hiatus between an early charcoal rich phase here and the later peat ash, peat ash rich phase, um, which ends shortly after that uh, 1104 layer. And this long hiatus, it's hard to see on this picture, but that um, late 10th century tephra actually falls right in the middle of the sort of sterile uh, phase in between the two um, dwelling phases. So these sites, and especially Neiferstetter, may have been trying to make the switch to become a proper farm at about the same time as that final round of farm creation across Hegrinus. Uh, so those very small farms that appeared in the last map on my earlier slide. So there may have been some social pressure to convert distant places to functioning farms if it seemed feasible. Um, finally, this is my favorite explanation for the sites. Um, the suggestion that the sites had a vital role to play in transforming the landscape from woodland to cleared pasture. So I discussed the early charcoal mittens, which suggests that the inhabitants of the sites may have been cutting trees to make charcoal and burning it as fuel up until the final moments before desertion. There's also two environmental data, data points that are important here. Um, the pollen data at the bottom of the screen um, from uh, Margaret Hausdaughter's work on Hegrinus in the 1980s shows that trees had disappeared from the region by the 11th century, around the same time that the small dwelling sites were depopulating. So again, it's possible that people lived at the sites until they had cut down the very last tree, thus sort of putting themselves out of a job, essentially. The erosion data at the top of the slide is from my own analysis of the nearly 7,000 cores that we recorded across Hegrinus on both projects. It shows an immediate impact of erosion following the settlement, uh, but then the impact begins to slow, almost starting to level out uh, by after the uh, 14th century. So together, these two environmental data points suggest that the sites were depopulated at about the same time that the landscape was beginning to find a new equilibrium following the extreme environmental stress of the early settlement. Um, so the sites may have been a sort of temporary outpost working to create pasture while also keeping animals away from the farms until the first home fields were cleared and prepared for ag agriculture, um, maybe, maybe even through the first few harvests. Um, so some evidence here includes the proximity to wetlands at all the sites, which would have provided a large open space for grazing while drier land was still wooded. Um, the distance from farms, potentially far enough away to keep livestock from wandering back. Oh, and I have another uh, image here. Um, that lack of disruption to early soils that I mentioned in regards to the coring data. Um, in comparison to soils at farmsteads. And uh, finally, along with that focus on wild foods. While they did manage livestock at the sites, it doesn't appear to have been their primary focus the way it so often is at farms. So basically, uh, this interpretation would imply that the sites were specifically intended to create a landscape that would work well for transhuman agriculture, that is lots of cleared pasture land, in the meantime keeping livestock away from home fields while they were being prepared. Um, there's a couple of implications here. So first, this implies that the sites may have been sub-households of large settlement farms. If so, this could be a way to begin to investigate inequality within households during the settlement period, which is often hard to do, operating on the assumption that everyone lived together in the longhouse. It also implies that sites like this may have been no longer needed after the landscape was fully transformed into something that we're more familiar with historically. So remember that along with these environmental changes, the abandonment also correlates with that last phase of farmstead creation through the 11th century. So what we may be seeing is a shift towards a new economy focused on land ownership and productivity as a source of wealth, heading towards that tenant farming economy that's familiar from Icelandic history. So of course, there's no records that actually suggest tenant 
tenement farming started this early. But if they were taking people off of places that were not able to support full farmsteads and then moving them to newly created farms, this could be the very beginnings of a process that then culminated in the historically documented system of tenant farming. So this story of dispersed sub-household dwellings exploiting specific resources is not entirely different from the so-called Scatlagrim model of settlement. This is derived from Eosaga, which describes the establishment of some non-farm dwellings during the late 9th century. When Scatlagrim settles in Borgefjörder, he gives land to members of his crew and his sons and establishes several places for himself, each specialized to exploit a specific ecological niche. So some are described as farms, but others are just described as a place where a man lived. And that's kind of like what we're seeing on especially if the sites are interpreted as sub-household sites that increase both the physical reach and the resource base of a primary settlement farm. So although the, the Hegrinus sites don't appear to have been as specialized as the dwellings uh, mentioned in the saga though. All right, so what about other sites like this in Iceland? Well, within the Skagafjordur, we saw some suggestions of potentially similar sites in the Longholt survey, uh, the uh, SAS project in the um, 2000s. There's also indications of small early dwellings in a few of the back valleys. And this is again coming from um, Gunizuega's uh, archae archaeolog archaeological work with the Big Deceptum Skagfordinga. Um, there are also reports of uh, similar sites in Mivans, right, that seem relatively similar. Some of you may be familiar with the Svegakot site, which has an early phase that looks kind of like some of what we're seeing at Hegrinus. And there are numerous other sites uh, through the survey reports and uh, the article that's mentioned at the bottom of your, of your screen that describes sites that appear to be of a similar size and duration and generally uh, character as what I'm seeing on Hegrinus. And since I've been talking about these sites, I've also heard from others of, of you around Iceland suggesting that places like this are not necessarily uncommon and potentially deserve uh, more attention. So that's the Icelandic context. In a broader view, there's been a good deal of research into the use of outlands in medieval and Iron Age Scandinavia, including particularly from Norway and Greenland. So the use of outlands uh, during this time was diverse, flexible, adaptable, including a whole range of activities from uh, fishing to mining to shealings. And the rain, they range in size from places, uh, from, from, from shealings and, and other places that look very much like farms such as Argus Breca in the Faroes, um, to what Christian Madsen has called marine shealings in Greenland. And many of these places appear never to have actually supported um, people living there um, for in any significant length of time at all. Um, often, especially in Greenland, uh, outland sites tend to be at transitions between wetland and heath, and sometimes were used only for up to a couple of centuries, maybe playing a transitional role between settlement and uh, the ethno-historical information. So this sounds uh, uh, kind of like what we're seeing in Hegrinus. It's possible that the early dwelling sites could represent a specific adaptation of existing Norse outfield practices to a new settlement landscape, maybe, maybe uh, transitional between the first settlement and that historic uh, settlement pattern that we're familiar with from the documentary record. Uh, so sometimes I describe these sites to people and they say, oh, that sounds like it's clearly a shielding. Uh, but it may not be quite so simple as a shielding. Um, usually we think of shielings as seasonal sites. Uh, another word for a shielding is a summer farm. Um, however, the Hegrinus sites don't seem to have been seasonal. And there's a couple points that suggest that. First, of the livestock bones, there's the full range of ages there. So they're not just um, they're not just uh, slaughtering the animals at a particular time of year, the way we might expect of a shielding. There's also no evidence of intervening sand layers in the midden. And what happens there is that sand will, will blow in on top of an abandoned site during the seasons when no one is living there. Um, and then they'll come back and more midden accumulates on top of that uh, small um, windblown layer. And sometimes these are evident during excavation. They were not evident during excavation at these sites. Um, however, in the future, I do have some money to go and excavate one of the sites and in collaboration with Karen Milik planning to do some micromorphology, which should uh, be able to nail down this question of seasonality. But if you look to the Iron Age in Scandinavia, there's actually much greater diversity in shielding use and type than is common later. And this includes sometimes year-round habitation. 
Uh, the transition to a more familiar, less diverse summer farm type of shielding seems to have happened during the 8th and 9th centuries, and that's just about the same time that the Norse were expanding into Iceland. So it's possible that small dwelling sites like those on Hegrenus might have been similar to Iron Age uh, diverse shielings adapted to the needs of the immediate context of settlement. And those needs seem to have included many of the same purposes that were later served both by seasonal sites as well as by farms, but were performed in the context of permanent habitation separate from a traditional farmstead. So if we think of the sites as shielings, uh, we'll need to consider it sort of as a landscape practice that makes sense from the perspective of the late Iron Age, rather than from a retrospective analogy to modern and historically documented summer farms. I also don't know of any Icelandic shielding sites that have been definitively dated to before about 930. So it's possible that very early shielding sites may just not quite look the same as what we expect from later ones. All right, so that brings me to the end of my talk. In conclusion, I have a bunch of small dwelling sites that date to the very earliest settlement. They only last maybe about a century, sometimes potentially less than that. They're different from farms in numerous ways that I've described. They seem important to the overall transformation of the landscape from forests to pastures, perhaps setting the stage for a change in the political economy. And they seem to make a little bit more sense from a broader Norse Iron Age perspective. And finally, they may be more common in Iceland than uh, maybe we think and might deserve a little bit more attention in the future. So I'd love to talk more with anyone who's seen similar things in their part of Iceland. Um, also, I do have funding to excavate Kultid. That's the site shown on your screen right now, one of the small sites. And hopefully that will tell us a bit more about all of these processes. I'm not sure if we'll be able to start work this summer. I do hope so, but if not this year, we'll definitely be there next year. So thank you so much for your attention this morning or, or this afternoon uh, in Iceland. And uh, thanks also to the people of Hegrenus and Skagafjordur, the institutions that have supported me financially and otherwise, as well as all of my colleagues and all the students on the project. And thanks again to Gavin for inviting me to speak today. And with that, I guess I'll stop my screen share and take some questions.